So it looks like we are on time to begin our open session for the Committee on Non-Human Primate Model Systems, uh, State of the Science and Future Needs. I'd like to uh, uh, welcome everyone, uh, uh, including our audience listening in uh, on the webcast. Uh, I am uh, Ken Ramos from uh, Texas A&M University and chair of the uh, committee. Uh, of course, we'd like to thank uh, NIH and uh, its representatives for sponsoring this study and for taking the time to speak with us uh, at this time, uh, certainly a critical time since we're now getting uh, started with the, uh, with the charge. Uh, note uh, that uh, this meeting uh, is of course being recorded uh, and transcribed and uh, that this recording will be posted uh, for uh, on the project you know, website uh, over the next couple of weeks uh, in case you want to uh, revisit uh, the contents of any of these discussion. Uh, I now would like to ask uh, Andy uh, Pope uh, from the uh, uh, Health Sciences Policy Board uh, to uh, uh, introduce himself and make up any remarks he wants to uh, share with us. Andy? Yeah, thanks very much, Ken. Um, I want to say, uh, on behalf of the National Academies, uh, welcome to the webinar participants to this uh, this first meeting of our new committee on state of the science and future needs for non-human primate model systems. Um, we're excited to get started here today. Um, I wanted to just remind everyone that the National Academy of Sciences was established uh, actually by Congress in 1863 uh, to serve as an independent nonpartisan nonprofit advisor to the federal government on matters of science and technology. And this, this study, in fact, um, is being done in response to a congressional mandate that uh, uh, came to us through NIH. And we are very fortunate today to have uh, the director of the Office of Science Policy at NIH, Dr. Lyric Jorgensen, uh, to present the charge to us today. And um, I don't need to say anything more than that, I don't think, other than to say a welcome to, to Lyric. Very thank you. Thank you very much for coming uh, to be with us today. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Andy. I am really excited to be here with you all today. Um, I am grateful that you all have agreed to take on this, this charge and I'm, I'm thankful to the committee who are volunteering their time to go ahead and, and take on this important effort. So I'm gonna share some slides to walk through some of the impetus for this um, tasking and what we're hoping to get out of this study. So um, uh, Larry, could it be all right if I read a disclaimer for public sessions before? Absolutely, please right. do. Uh, th thank you so much. Uh, this is uh, perhaps protocol, but I think something that is important, I think for uh, the sake of uh, uh, clarity of understanding on the part of those uh, participating in the meeting. So please bear with me as I read uh, this uh, uh, lengthy uh, uh, a disclaimer, and then we'll do a very quick round of introductions of the committee so that, Lyric, you have an idea of, uh, of who you know, you're addressing, uh, and then we'll go back to you. So thank you for that. Uh, as chair of the Committee of the State of the Science and Future Needs for Non-Human Primate Model Systems, I'd like to welcome everyone to the open session of the committee's first meeting. I want to know that this is an open, on-the-record information gathering session. That is, the committee is in the process of assembling materials that uh, it will examine and discuss in the course of making its findings and conclusions. Therefore, I ask everyone here today to be extremely mindful of the fact that the committee has made no conclusions and that it would be a mistake for anyone to leave here today thinking otherwise. Comments made by individuals, including members of the committee, should not be interpreted as positions of the committee or of the academies. This is the first of several planned committee meetings some of these meetings will include public sessions and we'll have an opportunity to hear from many experts in the field and receive public testimony. The committee will deliberate thoroughly before writing its draft report. Moreover, once a draft report is written, we must go through a rigorous review by experts who are anonymous to the committee and the committee then must respond to this review with appropriate revisions that adequately satisfy the Academy's Report Review Committee and the chair of the National Research Council before it is considered an NRC report. The report is expected to be publicly released in early 2023. Further information on this study, including future public meetings, can be found on the project website. 
The committee has been asked to conduct a landscape analysis and develop a report describing its findings and conclusions regarding the state of the science on non-human primate model systems, including their current role in biomedical research funded by the National Institutes of Health and future needs opportunities to improve human health and challenges for NIH-supported biomedical research involving non-human primates. The committee will also examine new approach methodologies such as in vitro methods and computational approaches, including the development status of these methodologies and ways to increase collaboration between NIH supported researchers who use non human primates and those who use new approach methodologies. The open session today provides an opportunity for NIH. Uh, the sponsor of this study to address the committee and describe the context and reasoning that went into the committee's statement of task so that we can better understand the scope and purpose of this study. During the discussion that follows, uh, the committee questions and comments will take priority. Following the presentation and discussion of the committee's charge, we will have an opportunity to consider questions and comments from members of the public audience, which can be submitted in written form at any time during today's open session during the webinar's question and answer uh, session. Uh, please be aware that comments and questions directed to the committee will be included in the public access file for this study and could be used in the development of the committee's report. Feedback on the study may also be submitted uh, through the project's public website. I would now uh, go ahead and uh, ask uh, the committee members to introduce themselves and I'll call on them for a very brief uh, uh, round of introductions, just your name and title uh, and affiliation. Uh, and we'll begin with uh, Chris Abbey. Chris? Uh, good, good morning. Uh, I'm an emeritus professor from the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, I have worked with non-human primates uh, uh, for much of my career, doing research on new dr drug development, as well as asking basic biomedical questions. Uh, I, uh, Chris? Uh, I have, I've served as a director of multiple uh, primate uh, resources in the past. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, let, let's try just give the uh, name and, and, and affiliation, please. Stefan Barron. Uh, Chief Scientific Officer at Very Sim Life. Thanks. Thank you. Eliza Bliss Moreau. My name is Eliza Bliss Moreau. I'm an Associate Professor of Psychology and a core scientist at the California National Primate Research Center, both of which are located at UC Davis. Thank you. Uh, Ricardo Carrion. Uh, Ricardo Carrion, Jr., Professor and Director of Maximum Entertainment Contract Research at Texas Biomedical Research Institute. Thank you. Uh, Mark Klein. Hi, Mark Klein, Professor of Pathology, Comparative Medicine, and Radiation Oncology at Wake Forest School of Medicine. Myrtle Davis. Myrtle Davis, Vice President of Discovery Toxicology, Bristol Myers Squibb Biopharm. Uh, Ashley F. Slebus. I'm Ozki Fazlabas. I'm Professor of Gynecology and Reproductive Biology at Michigan State University. Uh, Melanie Graham. I'm Melanie Graham, Associate Professor of Surgery in the Medical School and Associate Professor of Vet Population Medicine in the College of Vet Medicine at the University of Minnesota. Uh, Kelly Maycalf. Kelly Maycalf Pate, um, Director of the Division of Comparative Medicine and Associate Professor of Biological Engineering, MIT. Uh, Gu Li Ming. Gu Li Ming, uh, Professor of Neuroscience and Psychiatry at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, John Quackenbush. Hi, everyone. My name is John Quackenbush. I'm Professor and Chair in the Department of Biostatistics at the Harvard Teach Chan School of Public Health in Boston. Uh, Peter Strick. Hi, I'm Peter Strick. I'm Professor and Chair of the Department of Neurobiology and Scientific Director of the Brain Institute at the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, last but not least, uh, Jerry Tannenbaum. Jerry Tannenbaum, I'm Professor Emeritus of Veterinary and Animal Ethics and Law, a School of Veterinary Medicine, UC Davis. Thank you so much, uh, everybody. Uh, and now it's my great pleasure to uh, uh, go back to uh, Dr. Larry uh, Jergensen from the NIH, who will uh, have a presentation for us. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jergensen. 
Thank you very much. And thank you for um, those rounds of introductions. It was really great to hear about the diversity of expertise and, and positions on this group. Welcome to the public who is joining us today, wanting to make sure we provide some context and why NIH is engaging in this study and what we're actually, um, and the relevance of, of what we're trying to do here. So NIH, as you know, though, the committee that funds a wide array of research um, under the mission to support science and pursuit of knowledge. Again, the pursuit of knowledge, um, but again, to, to really work towards the biology and behavior of living systems to really think, focus on extending human life and, and reducing illness and disability. We rely on a, a, a variety of model systems to do this and, and use a variety of techniques and, and technologies to be successful in this endeavor, um, including research with animal species, including non-human primates, to help us understand these systems and human physiology. I wanted to let you all know, for those who had not seen some of this information from a recent report, that NHPs really are a key model for specific types of biomedical research, in part because of the anatomical and the physiological and behavioral similarity to humans. Um, they're used across all research stages. They're not only important for translational research, uh, as we've seen in the COVID vaccines and therapeutics, um, immunosuppressive therapies, treatments for radiation syndrome and other um, translational avenues, but really important for basic research. Um, work with non-human primates has resulted in tremendous advances in our understanding of basic biology. Um, Nobel Prizes for fundamental discoveries in neuroscience and, and other advances in reproductive health. Um, and again, many of you representing those, uh, those areas today. So they are a critical component of what we do here. However, I wanted to note that being said, NHPs have been estimated to only account for one half of 1% of all animals used in current biomedical research studies. So these resources are, um, are prioritized and, and conserved as needed to really advance research aims as appropriate. And of course, we all know that use of animals in research is done with the highest standards of rigor and animal welfare. We at this agency prioritize the position that welfare and ethical considerations is paramount to funding the best science and that they go hand in hand. Good study design um, includes good welfare, good environmental enrichment and other aspects to really have the most reproducible and valid study results. I'm not gonna go into the laws, policies and regulations today because that's not the scope of what we're trying to do, but I wanted to make it clear to those who are joining us that there are extensive laws, policies, guidance and more that NIH expects researchers to follow when conducting research with vertebrate animals, including NHPs. For example, as a condition of receiving funding from NIH, um, researchers and the IACUX, um, the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committees are required to ensure research involving care and use of animals is reviewed and determined to be both scientifically and ethically justifiable with the consideration of alternatives. Again, demonstrating why this is the most valuable research model for this study line of inquiry. Of course, recent major efforts at NIH go beyond these policies and, and more to ensure the responsible use of NHPs in biomedical research. I'm pleased to see some of you on the committee have been involved in some of these efforts, which is exciting to see you here again today. Some of these efforts have been working to ensure NHPs and all animal resources are used with the appropriate consideration of responsible use in terms of rigor, appropriate study model, study model ethical considerations, and more. For instance, we had an advisory committee meeting um, working group that focused on um, rigor and research, or um, sorry, focusing on enhancing rigor, transparency, and translatability in animal research. Again, all animal models, NHPs are um, a component of that. These efforts were working to help researchers inform the life cycle of a study from study concept and design until after results are reported. We're also having conversations about how fostering rigorous research can integrate considerations of welfare and ethics to really enhance study design and translatability of findings. And also thinking about resources and infrastructure. NHP models should depend on the appropriateness of the model and not be constrained or restricted by supply considerations. We also need to think about training, animal care staff, high quality housing needs, and more. So these are just some of the effort, efforts in the past few years really targeting into the responsible use of animals and research to enhance their um, application to our mission. This is why we welcome Congress's directive 
in the fiscal year 21 appropriations language that recognize the critical role non-human primates play in developing vaccines and treatments for public health threats, as well as in the basic research vein, and calls for NIH to commission this independent study that brings us here today. So I wanted to make sure you all saw the language from our congressional partners. Um, based on the review of the literature and other expert input, this committee will develop a report with its findings and conclusions related to the current and future roles of non-human primates in NIH-funded research. So scoping it to the NIH-funded research sphere. This will include the committee's findings related to gaps in research and resources, including those related to NHP availability and transportation needs. I wanna make a few notes about, um, about this in terms of one, you'll note that it's around NIH funded research. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, but also this is about your findings and conclusions. We are not asking for consensus recommendations. It's why we have such a diversity of expertise and, and disciplines here to tell us about these various areas as a findings and not the need to come to consensus recommendations. So I want to go um, into the actual charge to this committee based on the scoping of the language from the Hill. And it's divided into two parts with two subsections. So first is the current role of non-human primates in NIH funded research. So despite the broad debate we've had about the use of NHPs in research, there has not really been an independent and comprehensive report about the areas of research where they're used. We're asking this committee to dive in to the biomedical research areas in which non-human primates are used, whether it be for basic research, clinical research, or translational applications. It would also be really, really valuable to hear from you all regarding descriptions about why non-human primates are the research model employed in these areas. The second part of this charge is around the demand and, and use of non-human primates. So I'd point out that in 2018, NIH did author this report um, on NHP resources to aid in determining the best strategy for the facilitation of NIH research programs. I'm sure many of you know that NIH does have research programs devoted to non-human primates and to effectively plan for the future, this report was undertaken, analysis was undertaken. Um, however, I think we've all seen with COVID, um, there is a new demand placed on non-human primates, um, which has created some global increase in demand and increasing supply pressures. So some of the consideration we would like you all to give is to, to augment this report about aspects such as considerations for study design, data quality and validity, and interpretation of outcomes regarding the, the new demand placed after the COVID pandemic. The second part of the charge that we are asking you all to take on is the future role of non-human primates in NIH funded research. We look for the, the state of the science and the landscape analysis of the now, but where is the science taking us and what are the future needs going to be? Again, thinking through some of the supply issue, but where the areas of opportunities might be given the emerging science. So this in effect is a horizon scanning exercise. Um, Again, different biomedical research disciplines may have more opportunity than others, and this would be helpful to know. But importantly, we really want to understand what areas will be ripe for future investments and where the scientific opportunity and public health uh, needs might lie in terms of um, NHP research models. And then finally, along this vein and thinking about the future, we're also looking towards um, thinking about complementary approaches to catalyze discovery. So we're asking you all to outline some opportunities for what we're calling new approach methodologies to complement or reduce reliance on non-human primate research. We'd also like to hear more about strategies for increasing coordination and collaboration to make the most use of these resources about how we can use these two um, non-human primate models and new approaches as complementary methods and tools to increase validity and reliability. Just a note here, the use of new approach is not really intended to limit your thinking to what is undiscovered or, or what technologies are so much on the horizon. For instance, advances in stem cells, 3D printing, artificial intelligence, and even human models, frankly, could be included in this category. 
So we want to think about how we can complement the NHP port, um, um, resources with these other strategies for, for improving, improving biomedical research models. Before I want to wrap, before I wrap, I did want to point out to you all that this is really of interest across the agency. I think it was apparent from one of my earlier slides in which I showed you just how important non-human primates are to advancing all aims of research here. Um, there's broad interest in these issues across the agency, which you can see from who is co-sponsoring this study. This represents just a subset of the types of research that use non-human primate models and research. From the 2018 um, report that I referenced earlier, 19 of the 24 funding institutes and centers funded research using non-human primates from 2013 to 2017. So again, it's, a, it's only a half of a percent of all animals used in research, but it's a very valuable tool for those areas that, that are benefiting. So in summary, I wanted to just think about with you all um, how to um, embark upon this important task. Many questions rest on knowing precisely how non-human primates are currently used and where there will be need for non-human primates in the foreseeable future. Hopefully this work has already been done by, by others, including other prior studies, which will help build a foundation to make this really large multi-part charge um, more um, feasible. Um, but I look forward to, to seeing what you all are able to pull together. Thank you again for taking on this charge and lending your expertise to this important study. Again, we are extremely enthusiastic about receiving the findings. With that, I will stop sharing and take questions from the group. Thank you, Dr. Jorgensen. Uh, very much appreciated. Um, uh, I'll go ahead and ask a question of clarity and then ask the committee to start weighing in. Uh, you made reference to the number of institutes that have uh, used uh, uh, NHPs in their portfolio, and you said 19, if I heard you correctly. Uh, I believe that's correct, yes. All right, that's, that's actually quite an expensive you know, uh, number of institutes. That's, that's terrific to know. So with that, uh, turn it over to my colleagues on the committee. And can I add just to one thing that I did not touch upon my slides, but it was worth um, emphasizing, as I mentioned, the 19 out of 24, the original directive from our congressional partners asked this study to focus on some of the intramural research portfolio here at NIH. And because of this expansive investment and interest in non-human primates, we did extend the conversation from just our intramural portfolio to the extramural portfolio as well, again, to get this holistic picture of the state of science and the future needs instead of a snapshot that might not actually inform, again, this broader portfolio. Excellent. Uh, that actually was one of the questions that uh, we uh, intended to ask you, so you preempted that. That's wonderful. Uh, uh, committee members, if you could please raise your hand. Uh, John Quackenbush. Lurk, thank you very much for uh, providing some background for us. One of the things that I think about a lot when I consider the charge given the committee is just understanding the scope of where NIH's current thinking is and sort of the broader regulatory uh, community too, uh, as to what, uh, what types of experiments or what types of studies fundamentally require use of non-human primates versus those where uh, it's an option which may depend on much uh, more fine-grained details about what the study is actually trying to do. So what are the, what are the places which are really, uh, where human primates are really mandatory? I mean, we've heard a lot from the community on the importance of being able to replicate primate physiology. Again, this translatability to human systems. So I think in that aspect, it has proven to be really, really important, again, to replicate the unique primate systems. However, again, there's been a lot of conversation with those in the, in the non-human primate committee again about the basic, basic fundamental biology that can be studied, where the circuits and the, the mechanisms are uniquely accessible through NHP systems. So I would not want to preclude what the committee wants to look at. Um, 
I think it's important to make sure we're covering the spectrum and, and not at the expense of other areas where they provide valuable um, information. But are there places where you see them as being essential? Yes, and the essential, we, we try to stay away from the word needed or essential in our actual scoping because that value is, is somewhat in the eye of the beholder. So the, the question was really is where are they used and for what reason and why may they be uniquely suited for those questions? Um, again, to, to stay away from the value judgment as much as the landscape of understanding how they are used and why. Thank you. That, that was very helpful. So thank you. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, this is a question that I think has surfaced uh, multiple times uh, uh, related to how, how do you envision that uh, the NIH will uh, utilize uh, uh, the report, you know, and the uh, conclusions uh, that will be emerging from the report? Uh, what do you see as a path forward? I mean, some of the aspect is to explain to our stakeholders how they're used and why, again, the value they provide in, in, in multiple ways, but is also for thinking about, about the current use and the, the future use. I think through the COVID pandemic really showed us some areas in which resources needed to be reprioritized to be able to answer pressing public health emergencies. It came though at the expense of other research areas. And, I, and some of the aspect has to think about what does that mean? How do those, what are the implications of those decisions so that they are, are informed if, if ever we were faced in, with the situation again? I think I've also heard a lot of conversations about challenges in supply and demand and cost, frankly. Um, so for the agency to be responsible for the stewardship over taxpayer fund, being able to effectively plan for the future and be able to prioritize these needs um, and think through how people are using them is, is going to be an important uh, foundational document for us moving forward into the future. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I think yeah, Jerry Tannenbaum. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jorgensen, for the wonderful presentation. I wonder if you could say a bit more about fundamental research and its relevance to what we'll be doing. It, it, it's mentioned both in the mission statement, of course, of NIH, and in your presentation in terms of the percentage of, of, of animal of NHP use that's used in fundamental or basic research. Could you say a bit more about that, uh, about its relevance, for example, to need or necessity and so forth? Absolutely, it's an excellent question. And as a, as a person trained in neuroscience, I've had many conversations with the neuroscientific community and, and other communities like reproductive biology where you really have um, ethical limitations to studying these fundamental circuitry and, and, and basic functions in, in human models. Um, and the conversations, it's, it's less about the translatability in terms of developing a new drug or treatment, but really understanding how physiology works before we can even move into the translational aspect, being able to, to understand these systems and the way biology can be perturbated is of increasing uh, interest. Um, and, and as we are learning more about about the genetic applications that can be done in marmosets and in other animals, I think that is going to be something that is an increased demand and, and not a decrease in, in the future. Thank you, that's very helpful. And of course, when we're talking about basic or fundamental research, predictability and necessity are, are concepts that become very cloudy sometimes. Uh, Dr. Faslibes. Thanks, Dr. Jorgensen. So my question also, oh, I don't know what's going on with my camera for some reason, <laughs> let me turn it off. Uh, but the uh, question I had also was, as you were talking about emerging technologies and like the pandemic and COVID-19, I'm, I'm trying to also understand in terms of NIH's uh, components and thinking with regards to availability and uh, being able to really uh, be able to utilize these animals when we need them in emerging diseases as they come along. And I'm sure there's gonna be a number of them coming along and how we balance what we need with regards to the uh, availability of these animals. 
Yeah, it's a really important question. And again, the hope is, is some of this report in, in terms of providing again the findings of, of the state of science and the anticipation of where we are going is really allow us to have an informed look at how they are being used to make these conversations um, um, more evidence-based as we move into the future. I think the hope is to never have to make these tough choices, but in a public health emergency, we found that that lots of conversations um, <laughs> needed to be had. So I think having this landscape analysis and, and really thinking about who needs these resources and, and what are the models and mechanisms? And again, this is outside the my, my scope as a policy director, but you, you obviously, those of you working in this field, know the Office of Research Infrastructure and, and primate centers and, and others think about these models as well. So hopefully it will not be just a resource for NIH, but for other of those that are really maintaining these colonies and trying to supply their institutions um, for their important research questions. So I'm, I'm hoping, again, this will be a really, really foundational resource for the community as a whole. Uh, Dr. Strix. Yes, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, my question is how we can be more impactful than uh, prior committees. Um, I think the 2018 report was fairly comprehensive. And it seems to me that some of these questions are being re-asked. And um, particularly the notion about the importance of non-human primate research. Um, you list all of the neurologic and neuropsychiatric and vision institutes. Um, and in some respects, the burden of neurologic disease is just remarkable. And we're gonna face a tsunami of long COVID. And we're already facing a tsunami of Alzheimer's disease. And so the issue of um, creating the opportunity for discovery of new treatments and cures in these disease, you know, to those of us in the field seems obvious, but it's clear that we're not making this case well enough so that Congress is asking this question again. And so really what I, I'm interested in knowing is how can we provide you with the information that will be more impactful than prior reports. Thank you. Thank you for this question. And, and from where I sit, I am often said these two things. One, animal people who work with animals say there's no way we'll ever replace animal models. They're essential. And then we hear animal models are terrible models for human disease and treatments, and they tell us nothing. And people who are not steeped in this conversation say these are inconsistent statements. When I actually think at some level they are true. Animal models provide very interesting insights, provide us with directions. They are essential and invaluable, and they are model systems. They are limited because they are not humans, and these things can be true. The question is, how do we bridge this conversation that models are just that? models of things and their scale up applicability to translation and other components. So I think part of part of saying this message is being clear why these messages are not actually inconsistent and both true and almost the inverse. Um, but the second component is having the state of the science that is not arguing about the value. Again, as we mentioned to not have the value judgment, but as where there are opportunities and where there are challenges. So for me, having a report that has the ground truth of where there really is opportunity and maybe where there's not opportunity, it, 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 where something that's not a document that just says they are essential for everything all the time. Maybe there are areas where they are not, or maybe where there's areas where there should be prioritized that show a balanced and thoughtful report about how this can really be, be used. And, and so that's where I think some of the value in, in what you produce can, can be in terms of actually not show, arguing about the value, but arguing about the actual science and evidence that it, it, it creates. Would it be fair to say then, based on that response that you provided, that some degree of uh, specificity to the extent that would be reasonable would be a welcome addition to the report? I believe so. I believe we are really looking to you all as the experts in the fields of where where there's real opportunity, where they're completely making science 
easier, more replicatable, more translatable, basic discoveries more easy um, to be to be made. Um, and where there are the limitations, it doesn't mean that the map the model isn't value, but here's what it can tell you, and here's what it cannot tell you. And here's where you need a complementary approach to be able to augment the findings from these models to really make the catalyze that difference. Okay. Any other questions from the committee? I believe that maybe uh, uh, to, to the last point that you made, uh, uh, perhaps some, some uh, uh, sense on uh, the degree to which uh, uh, alternative models, complementary models, uh, would be uh, appropriate for uh, uh, discussion. It would seem to be based on what you said, that as we identify uh, uh, limitations, if you would, for NHPs, uh, and then maybe taking advantage of uh, technological advances and uh, new methodologies that would be complementary and probably even help fill the gap for some of those would be appropriate for inclusion in the report. Would you agree to that? That is absolutely what we are looking for, is where are these opportunities to complement non-human primate research models or areas where new approaches might actually provide more insight and are complemented by non-human primate models to the, to the reverse. Um, and, and where those areas of opportunity are would be really, really welcome by the agency. Yeah, uh, and I think that actually dovetails really well, uh, Peter, with uh, with the question that you asked about how is it that you know the impact of our report uh, could could be enhanced, uh, you know, uh, uh, relative to future or, or past reports. I think that uh, Stephen Barron has a question. So, Stephen. Yeah. So maybe it's just just more of a, of a comment than a question. So I, I really appreciate like you know mentioning about you know where these models are working, where the models are not working and complementary models like alternatives and et cetera. But I think also there's opportunity for us, you know, is there an, I guess, is there an opportunity to extract more information from the NHPs with novel technologies um, and provide us with actionable insight from the models that we're already working with? Um, and, and something you know, I mentioned earlier is the, the digital biomarkers. So just like we monitor patients where we, you know, bring the trials to the patients, do that at home. Um, we can monitor them 24 seven and extract data that way. You know, there's potential opportunity here with non human primates with the models that we're using, incorporating the type of monitoring um, and then extracting more information uh, from the models that we already are using or are gonna use anyhow. I think that's an, an excellent comment or <laughs> point to be made in terms of as we have new technologies coming online that is shaping our future and that is new opportunities to be able to gather new information and new data to, from the um, non-human non primate models that actually complement other avenues. So I think that's definitely within scope. Okay. So Autumn, uh... Uh, I believe that we have covered, I think, all of the questions that we had initially uh, identified. Uh, am I correct in making that statement or do we have any areas in those questions that we did not uh, address? Uh, no, I think that um, you covered all of the, the key aspects that the, the committee wanted to make sure were addressed today. So are there any additional questions or comments that anybody else would like to make? Uh, we've got uh, Dr. Jorgensen's uh, brain here, so we need to take advantage of it. Uh, and it uh, looks like uh, we've got uh, Mark Klein uh, with a question. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, yes, thank you for that overview, Dr. Jorgensen. Could, um, could you comment on the uh, the uh, scope of the, our, our task with respect to uh, how we should view FDA approval studies or, or, or impact on FDA approval studies. You know, for example, GLP studies that are done under the, uh, 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 in, in order to seek drug approval. Yeah, it's, a, it's an excellent question. I mean, obviously, there this comes into the different types of, of research that's being conducted, and, and model systems are required for FDA approval, and some of the conversation about new approaches, um, unless those are put into 
the system for approval. Um, so I think those are some of the conversations that can be touched on in terms of the, the reason why some of these models may not be able to be replaced and the value they bring. Um, but I leave it to the, the committee to work through some of that in terms of, again, the, the limitations and the um, necessity, using the word that I'm asking you not to use, <laughs> for these models in the system. Very good. I would also just like to, to you know, comment one of the, the thoughts after speaking with you all, I'm not sure if I, I made it really clear, is that we are really looking forward to hearing from you as experts across different domains, different disciplines, um, different types of research to really put down your ideas and knowledge of the state of the science and of the landscape as this, again, evidence-based conversation about how they're being used and these real limitations and opportunities. We, uh, we have no predetermined um, outcome. And I appreciate the conflict of interest statement that was read in the beginning, because that really is the case here. We are looking at you as the experts to help shape the future thinking here. Um, so I wanted to make sure that that was, that was stated as well. Thank you. Chris uh, uh, Abbey. I think you're muted, Chris. There you go. Uh, thank you. And, and thank you, Dr. Jarvis, for your uh, statement of charge, really. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, although the pharmaceutical industry is not a sponsor, uh, more primates are used in pharmaceutical research by probably three times as many primates. That greatly impacts the availability of primates for NIH-sponsored research. Uh, how should our committee view pharmaceutical research uh, with respect to the impact on the use of primates in biomedical research? Because certainly that impacts NIH uh, re uh, grant recipients. Thank you for that question. It was one that was heavily debated in thinking about the, the scope and the charge and, and information in terms of, again, um, we are not the only players in the, in the research game. And, and to your point, the pharmaceutical and biological industry use non-human primates very heavily. So I think while we are not asking you to conduct a landscape analysis of private sector use that's outside of the task, I do think it is fair in terms of supply and demand issues to talk about constraints in the system that need to be factored in. It would be short-sighted to pretend that this was not a factor affecting the system. And I think that this, this committee can feel within scope to acknowledge that that is a, an additional component that, that needs to be considered in, in any planning purposes. All right, uh, uh, Dr. Metcalf, uh, uh, Patty, go ahead. Good afternoon. Thanks, Dr. Richardson. That was a very um, excellent um, presentation on what our scope of charge is and very helpful. Um, in reflecting on the conversation that we had prior to meeting today as a committee and also on our statement of task, the scope is very broad. And we're being cautioned to keep away from making value judgments, but we might make inherent value judgments in the amount of effort that we place on different parts of the scope. So I'd be very curious if the NIH has any guidance for us in terms of percentage of effort that they want us to devote to the different parts of the statement of task. Specifically, should we be approaching this from the avenue first of looking at the non-human primate models, or should we be approaching it from the avenue first of looking at the uh, new approach methodologies. Um, does the NH have a preference as to how we do this? That is an excellent question. Um, interestingly, one had not thought of before. And so I was, I was thinking through it in my head, which you see my eyes go up when I'm thinking. Um, I do not think that NIH has a preference in terms of which one you address first. I think that the guidance, the best guidance I can give is thinking through the NIH mission that we are less interested in prioritizing the model per se, as much as we are prioritizing the science we hope to fund, um, the research we aim to support and what models 
best make that achievable um, and where there are limits and where there are, again, are opportunities. So I, I don't think there's a specificity in the order of the task. And I would probably encourage you all to think about, again, what we are trying to achieve in terms of science and, and how to get there. Any additional comments or questions? Uh, we still have uh, a bit of time. Uh, and uh, following this discussion with uh, Dr. Jorgensen, we will uh, take questions from uh, the uh, public on the, on the uh, online questions, which I think have begun to, to percolate. Uh, but I don't want to cut this short unless we uh, absolutely feel that we got what we needed. Um, so um, we will have uh, other public uh, open sessions uh, in the future. And uh, uh, to, to the extent that uh, some of these questions can be aired again, uh, we certainly can take advantage of that opportunity. Um, I think that uh, your presentation uh, was highly informative and very, very helpful uh, in, in helping us uh, granulate somewhat, you know, uh, the written statement of task. Uh, it I, makes the point that nothing really beats an interaction, you know, that's uh, in our case virtual, but nonetheless, uh, uh, very, very helpful, you know, in, in adding perspective and uh, enabling us to, uh, to better understand what we uh, can do uh, to help. Uh, NIH and, and uh, your stakeholders uh, address the issues. Uh, and so we're very thankful to you for your time and, and clarity of presentation. And uh, I see uh, that uh, Andy has his hand up. So before I say my last thank you, I'll turn it over to Andy. Oh, well, I, I just wanted to also say thank you to, uh, to Lyric for coming and, and uh, making that wonderful presentation and answering questions today. And also wanted to make it clear to the committee that um, this isn't the last chance that you'll have to talk with Lyric. Um, and believe me, there will be questions <laughs> about the scope and the task and where the, where the boundaries are and what, where we should be uh, um, or where you should be as a committee focusing your energies, et cetera, and, what, and questions about what this means and that means and should we and could we go here and there kind of thing. So that kind of thing will come up in the future. And I'm I'm sure that Lyric will answer our emails and our, our phone calls if we, uh, if we reach out to her. So I just wanted to make it clear uh, to the committee that this is not you know, the only opportunity we'll have to talk with her about that. And also just to say thank you very much again uh, for her coming today. Uh, and um, I guess, can we just go to the public questions at this point? Yeah, I, I believe so. Uh... Uh, Dr. Uh, Jorgensen, thank you so much. Uh, we'll be in touch again, you know, as needed uh, later on. Uh, very helpful. So, Autumn, uh, how should we uh, navigate uh, the public uh, uh, questions? Uh, I see some in the chat and then some in the uh, uh, question and answer uh, session. So your input could be helpful here. I think it would just be the ones that are in the uh, question, the Q and A box. Um, okay. Those are the questions that are coming from from the audience. Um, I don't know if you can see the ones in the open, but I'm happy to also address them to the committee uh, if that would be easier. Are we able to uh, keep Lyric with us for this for this part of the session? Lyric, are you available? Can you can you stay? I am available. I will take direction from the committee if it's something you would like to turn to me or if you would like to keep it. I want to make sure it is an independent commission study and, you, and we'll um, defer to you all for whether or not Great. you let me participate. Perfect. Terrific. Um, and we've got, you know, plenty of people that would know when when it's appropriate and when it's not. So that's that's really wonderful. Um, so I'm seeing uh, three questions uh, in the uh, in the uh, question and answer box, and so the first one is from uh, Kirk Leach. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and read it. Uh, uh, it says, uh, "Hi, my name is uh, Kirk Leach. I'm the executive director of the European Animal Research Association. Given there's currently a, a global shortage of NHPs." Uh, essentially due to China's export ban. Do you see this study helping to convince the U.S. administration that this threat to research needs a political response? 
I'm not sure that that is a question the committee's uh, ready to answer at this point in time, uh, but uh, uh, Autumn, I'll ask for your guidance on that. Yeah, I think um, at this time we're um, primarily looking for questions about the, uh, the charge to the committee. Obviously, the committee is just getting underway and hasn't had a chance yet to um, really get the information gathering process uh, of the study um, going in. So um, I think certainly the issue of availability was called out in the statement of task, uh, primate availability, and the committee will be uh, looking at uh, the, the challenges related to primate availability. All right, uh, Lisa Jones Engel asked, uh, uh, Dr. Strick asked uh, uh, how this committee can be more impactful than prior committees. Uh, in 2011, a committee determined that chimpanzees, our closest primate relatives, uh, had consistently failed to provide meaningful uh, advances in human health. How much more impactful can this uh, current monkey committee expect to be? Um, my answer to, to that question, and then I'll ask uh, Dr. Strick to, to comment as well, uh, would be uh, science continues to evolve all the time. And uh, I think as a function of that evolution of science and technology is our ability to answer questions that in the past might have been difficult to answer, but that could then be answered you know, in, the, uh, in the advent of new uh, discoveries and new advances. And so um, when you re-engage in things that uh, did not yield a lot of product you know, in the past, actually that's not total, you know, it's not a waste of time because as that evolution takes place, obviously the ability to give their answers uh, continue to change and evolve. Uh, Dr. Strick, do you want to uh, uh, comment since uh, uh, the impact question came from you? Oh, I, I think your answer deals with it well. All right. Next uh, question uh, came from uh, Kate uh, Kinderis. Uh, will ethical considerations be considered? And uh, my answer to that is, uh, uh, of course. Uh, uh, Autumn, do you want to elaborate on that? Um, I don't. I don't really have anything specific uh, to to add, except that um, you know I think that the statement of task really lays out the the charge that is before the committee. There are not. Um, there's not explicit uh, reference to ethical issues related to. Uh, Use on um, on primates, but I'll ask uh, Dr. Jorgensen if she'd like to um, add anything uh, regarding that issue of scope. Thanks so much, Autumn. Um, we do recognize, and in terms of you, you saw that earlier in the presentation, and again, some of you were at this workshop that there are ethical questions that can be answered in terms of appropriate research model. And we had this workshop on, you know, how does housing and other treatment of animals, some might call that welfare, some might other, some call it ethics. And it's that beautiful intersection of terms of um, appropriateness for the research study design. So if you're studying some sort of psychiatric conditions, making sure that there's enrichment that replicates the, the, the um, environment needed to to develop those systems is really important. So there are conversations about ethics in terms of study design and truthfully at the intersection of rigorous research. Um, and I does believe that conducting rigorous research studies and the appropriateness of the model, the study, the results are all in co essential components. So I think ethics is interwoven in multiple aspects of the charge. Um, and, I, and I envision that, and again, the, the opportunities and the limitations of and the HP models have some inherent ethics about those kind of studies being conducted in terms of the design. Yeah, uh, uh, excellent answer. I think you know the interdependence of, of ethics and uh, scientific appropriateness of any study uh, go hand in hand. Uh, uh, you know, in fact, in the absence of uh, ethical conduct, uh, you you almost invalidate the uh, the appropriateness and the justification for the scientific study itself. So. Uh, they, they go together. Um, um, we have the next question is from uh, uh, Kathleen uh, Conley, who, who asks, uh, uh, will the committee be addressing limitations of, uh, limitations of NHP models? And as uh, uh, noted uh, in Dr. Jorgensen's uh, answer uh, presentation, uh, uh, 
uh, we will be uh, uh, tackling those and, and, and looking uh, at ways that uh, improvements can be made and, and that complementary approaches can be, uh, can be uh, uh, addressed. Uh, the next question is from uh, Catherine Kreide, uh, uh, who asks, uh, given the limited supply of NHPs, will the committee be exploring existing disaster readiness uh, and or emergency management planning at uh, animal research facilities to help safeguard the animals? We have currently an ongoing research underway. Uh, uh, again, uh, uh, this is a question that uh, we probably need to answer uh, a bit down the road uh, since the committee is just now getting started, but uh, uh, excellent point uh, that, that's been made. Uh, Uh, John Dennis uh, asks, uh, uh, someone was asking about FDA needs uh, for NHP studies. Although I can't speak on behalf of FDA, uh, no one generalized an answer uh, because it is very uh, product specific. Small molecules, new chemical entities, biologics and vaccines are quite different with diverse questions that reviewers may want to be uh, answered. Uh, sometimes involve uh, potential use of NHPs. Uh, sponsors should always communicate with FDA in advance before setting up uh, pivotal experiments uh, when there are questions about the need for NHB studies and possible use of alternatives. Um, so it's so a more statement of fact. And then uh, uh, Lisa Jones and you'll, uh, I think has a new question that says, how will the committee navigate and or access the data given uh, uh, that it has no uh, primatologists? Uh, that show that despite the less than one half of 1% of monkeys using biomedical research will primate populations in Asia have crashed. The consequences of the extraction of primates from these habitat countries has been catastrophic. Uh, so uh, a more statement than, than a question. And so I'll leave it at that. And I believe that is, uh, uh, there's one new one uh, from Joe Newsom. Uh, will methodologies for, for prioritizing within and across disciplines funding and access to these limited resources be considered by the committee? Um, that has been part of what we expect to be able to do. So appreciate uh, your question and, uh, and encouragement in that particular regard. And can I just, um, that issue of prioritization, I thought that might be actually a good one to also discuss uh, with, with NIH while we have them here. The committee has been asked to conduct this landscape analysis, looking at um, the current uh, role for and future needs for non-human primates. And I just would uh, be interested in, in Lyric's input on um, this issue of prioritizing and, and whether um, NIH is interested in any kind of prioritization of needs or if this is meant to be more of a descriptive landscape analysis. Thank you so much for the question, Autumn. As, as mentioned earlier, we are not looking for a consensus study, which does create some, some different constraints. We were very adamant of the importance of having people who work with non-human primate models being on this group. That does cause, um, you know, there's, there's inherent conflicts of having studies making prioritizations about which areas of funding are, are most valuable. So I think the, the goal here was really to have you all as experts talking about how they are used, where are the where is the future going and the limitations and less of a, a value base on which fields are more important important in quotations because that is a that's a different kind of study. So the landscape analysis is more towards the terms of what we are looking for. Thank you, Eric. Excellent. So uh, there's no more questions and answers. Uh, and I think that we have asked all the questions that we needed to ask uh, from Dr. Jorgensen. So uh, Autumn, should we uh, break and resume at uh, 1.45 Eastern time? Um, yeah, we can, we can break until 1.45. I do just wanna uh, note that uh, there will be uh, future public meetings with additional opportunities uh, uh, for, for public comment on the uh, study. And so um, this is not the last opportunity, um, but we did wanna thank uh, those who provided questions today. Uh, yes, and before we go, uh, obviously, we'd like to uh, thank uh, uh, the NIH and uh, uh, Dr. Jorgensen for uh, taking the time to speak with the committee. 
uh, this has been extremely helpful. Um, and of course, uh, we appreciate uh, the sponsorship of the study because it's obviously raising important questions for the future uh, of the nation and our ability to be responsive uh, to the uh, scientific and medical needs uh, that might uh, come up in the future. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the uh, public uh, that joined us uh, during this open session. Uh, of course, I uh, appreciate uh, the questions uh, and the comments provided. I think they always add perspective to, to the challenge and the uh, task at hand. And uh, as uh, Autumn noted, um, there's going to be plenty of opportunity for other public sessions uh, and input uh, to be provided uh, uh, by you. Uh, I'd like to remind members of the public uh, that any feedback or uh, materials that uh, they wish to share with the committee uh, can be submitted through the project website uh, and will be made uh, publicly available uh, through the project public access file. Uh, this is required uh, by the academies uh, to comply um, with uh, uh, Section 15 of the Federal Advisory Committee Act rules. Uh, and uh, without further ado, I will uh, call the uh, open session to a close and uh, ask committee members to remain logged uh, in so that you avoid any chances that uh, connectivity gets uh, uh, disrupted. So please stay on. Uh, of course, you can mute yourselves and, and stop your cameras, but uh, uh, stay on and uh, enjoy uh, the time that you have before we resume at uh, 1.45 uh, Eastern time. And uh, be prompting coming back uh, since uh, that will be a closed session uh, where we will be uh, debriefing on uh, a number of issues that we've discussed so far. Uh, so uh, thank you again to all the participants and especially to Dr. Jorgensen uh, and the public. Bye-bye. Thank you, Lyric.